بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وأنم علينا يا عظيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسل لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قول أما بعد All praise be to Allah سبحانه وتعالى and peace be upon his beloved prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم I testify that there is no God except Allah Almighty and I testify that Muhammad is the prophet and the messenger of Allah Brothers and sisters in Islam we continue with the life story and the biography of this great man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had restricted our entrance to the paradise only through his path, only through his teachings, only behind him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And last week we spoke about a very important point, a very important event, an event that changed that changed history around, an event that changed the strategy of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the da'wah of Islam. And that was Sulh al-Hudaybiyah, al-Hudaybiyah Treaty or Truce. And we mentioned how the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saw in the dreams that he was going to perform Umrah. He was marching out of Medina to perform Umrah. And then the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam informed the companions and he went out with 1,400 of his companions to perform Umrah, but they were stopped and paused by the people of Mecca, and then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam accepted a truce between him and the people of Mecca, and amongst those conditions that Muhammad goes back that year, and comes back the following year, and stays in Mecca for three days, and they are only allowed to carry from the weapons what a traveler needs to carry from a weapon. And also from those conditions, that whoever comes to Muhammad from Mecca without the permission of his guardian, Muhammad has no rights to keep him. And whoever, whoever comes from Muhammad to Mecca with or without the permission of his guardian, the people of Mecca have the rights to keep them. So that condition, that last condition was a bit tough for the companions to accept. But the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam at the end, he weighed the matters and he saw the best interest of Islam that he alayhi salatu was salam accepts that treaty and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala later on reveals to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam inna fatahna laka fatham mubina verily we had opened to you a great opening that was an opening to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam although from the outside and might say as Umar ibn al-Khattab said we had given ourselves the lower the Muslims had taken the lower side of the negotiation the Muslims had humiliated themselves in that negotiation, the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah, Allah will prevail my religion. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will spread Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did, did endorse what the Prophet ﷺ said. What did, did endorse what the Prophet ﷺ said? That Allah Azza wa Jal later on reveals that we had opened to you, O Muhammad, a great opening. And the Sahaba realized that it's not always what they see from the outside. It's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had hidden, and it's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had written, and it's what Allah azza wa jal had planned. And it's important for the Muslims to understand the Sulh al Hudaybiyah, the Hudaybiyah treaty, treaty or truce, that sometimes it's not about compromising, but sometimes we need to look at the best interest of the Muslims. And not what's the best interest of the Muslims now, but what's the best of the interest of the Muslims now and later. And when the Prophet والسلام, accepted that last condition, that whoever comes from him to the people of Mecca with or without his consent, the people of Mecca have the rights to keep him. And whoever leaves from Mecca to the Prophet والسلام, without the consent of their guardian, the Prophet والسلام, has no rights to keep him. We saw how later on the Prophet والسلام, والسلام, from his wisdom that the people of Mecca while after that they came running to the Prophet ﷺ asking him to cancel that condition 
when Allah of the Muslims he started to come to Medina and the Prophet ﷺ refused to accept them because he wants to stick by his conditions. He wants to stick by his word. How many of those Muslims who left Mecca had nowhere to go except to start attacking the caravans that belonged to the people of Mecca. So later on the people of Mecca ran to the Prophet ﷺ asking him and begging him that alayhi salatu wasalam will cancel that last condition. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam reminded the companions at the end of the day, Allah and his messenger know better. Allah and his messenger know better. From amongst those who also came to the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam without the consent of their guardians from Mecca were the Muslim females. The Muslim females, the Muslim women who were treated very badly at Mecca and they were mistreated in Mecca just because they believed in Allah and his messenger. And how they were left behind in Mecca as captives by their own families and tribes. And how they came later on to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam accepted them. And he said, the conditions that are agreed between me and the people of Quraysh says men. And it does not say women. So the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam accepted them. Under the condition that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala laid down to him in surah al-mumtahina. To be examined that if they believe in Allah and His Messenger and they follow which what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger had ordained. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says that the Muslims have more rights over them than the non-Muslims including their husbands. And from that verse we understand that a Muslim woman is not allowed to stay with a non-Muslim man. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, إِذَا جَاءَكَ الْمُؤْمِنَاتُ يُبَيَانَكَ عَلَىٰ أَلَّا يُشْرِكْنَ بِاللَّهِ شَيْئًا وَلَا يَسْرِقْنَ وَلَا يَزْنِينَ وَلَا يَأْتِينَ بِفَاحِشَةً And the rest of the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh Muhammad, if the believing women come to you and they want to make a pledge between you and them that they do not associate any partners with Allah, not that they steal or commit zina or commit any fornication <coughs> or commit any haram, then O oh Muhammad, give them the pledge. Give them the pledge. So many of those women came and the, that verse was an indication to many of the Muslims that they rather keep or they rather have a Muslim believing woman with them than a non-Muslim or a non-Muslim uh, female. So after that verse, many of the companions who were married to non-Muslim women, they divorced them. Many of those Muslims who were married to non-Muslim women, they divorced them. Sulul Hudaybiyah, my brothers and sisters, was an opening to the Prophet ﷺ from many directions, from many angles. Not only that the Prophet ﷺ, managed alayhi salatu was salam not to clash and lose lives between him and the people of Quraysh and at the end of the day he will get what he wanted and what he wanted sallallahu alayhi wasallam is to perform umrah and he will get that the following year but also it was opening to the prophet alayhi salatu was salam it gave him that time while he has truce between him and his enemies to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not only that but the reason Salih al Hudaybah was the reason that many of the great enemies of Islam came back embracing Islam, including Khalid ibn Walid, Amr ibn al As, and Uthman ibn Talha. Those three men who later on became companions of the Prophet Muhammad were one of the most hardest and harshest enemies to the Prophet. And we know Khalid ibn Walid and the stance of Khalid ibn Walid to the Prophet Muhammad. And when the following year, the Prophet ﷺ went to perform the Umrah, as he agreed that he'll come the following year, Khalid bin Walid could not even, could not even handle seeing the Muslims making tawaf or performing tawaf around the Kaaba. So he went out of Mecca. He didn't want to even be at Mecca. That's how much enmity and hostility he had towards the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslims. But look at the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. Look at the wisdom of this man that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Indeed, we have sent you a mercy to mankind. By Allah, he is a mercy to mankind. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam knows who Khalid is. And what Khalid had done to Islam and to the Muslims. That Khalid himself said, my sword was bent because I killed so many Muslims with that sword. Killed so many Muslims who were fighting for the sake of Allah. But yet the mercy of the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam, his ha alayhi salatu was salam did not block him from even accepting Khalid to be one day a Muslim. <coughs> the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam amongst his followers was Walid ibn al-Walid, who was, the Khalid, uh, he, he was the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid. So Khalid had a brother, his name al-Walid ibn al-Walid, 
And Walid ibn Walid was one of the followers of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam went the following year to perform Umrah, obviously he saw many of the people of Quraysh. But there was one man who did not, he did not see sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It was Khalid. He didn't see him. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows who Khalid is. Khalid is an enemy. A severe enemy to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and to Islam. When the Prophet ﷺ was performing Umrah one year after the Hudaybiyah Treaty, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam realized that he did not see Khalid ibn Walid. So he asked his brother, Al Walid ibn Walid. He told Al Walid, Where is Khalid? I'm amazed he's not here. Subhanallah, you the messenger of Allah. You ask about Khalid? What would you want to ask about Sallallahu Khalid? Did you forget who Khalid is? Not only that, but the Prophet ﷺ, from his wisdom, he said, it amazes me to someone like Khalid, someone with wisdom, someone with some understanding, that yet, till this day, he, has not, he had not yet embraced Islam. Subhanallah, you amaze me, O Messenger of Allah. Wallahi, the Prophet ﷺ amazes me, that he is even concerned about his enemies. How he could bring him to Islam? which shows us that Islam did not come to fight or to kill or to slaughter or to declare war. Islam came to save people from the hellfire. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ wants. He wants to save, even though it's Khalid ibn Walid, someone that his own sword was bent because he fought so many Muslims, but yet the Prophet ﷺ was still concerned about someone like Khalid ibn Walid. So he told his brother Al-Walid ibn Walid, it amazes me someone like Khalid, Yet he has not even embraced Islam. Someone with a lot of wisdom, someone who is understanding and smart. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, By Allah, if he becomes a Muslim, if Khalid ibn Walid becomes a Muslim, Khalid ibn Walid will be something in Islam. He will be someone. Someone like him. He has good characteristics as a human being. If he uses that for Islam, he'll reach somewhere in Islam. So what did Al-Walid ibn Walid do? He started to ask, Where's my brother? It turned out to be that Khalid ibn Walid deliberately and intentionally left Mecca because he does not want to see the Muslims doing tawaf around the Kaaba. Subhanallah. But the Prophet ﷺ, even though he knew about that, this did not make him turn away from himself. You know, my Allah damn him. You know, this guy, he's a dog that will get to the hellfire. These are the words that you find sometimes as Muslims we use against someone that we look down at. Instead of us wishing da'wah for them, or wishing good for them, or wishing hidayah for them. The Prophet ﷺ is wishing hidayah for someone that fought against Muslims, wishing guidance for them. As a Muslim, I should wish guidance for everyone. Let it be whoever it is. So later on, when Al-Walid ibn Walid went back to Medina, he still, he gripped on those words of the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, this is my chance to send a letter to my brother. So he wrote a letter to his brother Khalid ibn Walid in Mecca. And he sent it to him. And he said, the other day when we were in Mecca, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ asked about you. The Prophet Muhammad ﷺ, the one that you've been fighting against and wishing for him to die at any moment or second, wishing all evil and harm to come to him, he wished the other day for you they enter Islam. And he said these words about you, someone like Khalid with wisdom and understanding, I'm surprised that this till this day he has not yet become a Muslim. If he comes to Islam, he'll have status in Islam. He'll be someone in Islam. So when Khad ibn Khalid read that, he came back to his sense. He came back to his intellect. And yes, he had some wisdom as the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam said. So he came from Mecca running to the Prophet Wasallam to embrace Islam. And on the way, when Khalid was going along, look, it's embarrassing for him. I'm the one that's been declaring war on Muhammad. And I'm the one that's getting everyone to fight Muhammad. And I'm the one that's always against Muhammad. It's very embarrassing for him to go, to go to his friends and say, you know, I'm going to Medina to embrace Islam. So he wanted to go out lonely. He wanted to go out alone. He doesn't want anyone to know of him. But subhanAllah, on the way, he met other two other people from Quraysh. Amr ibn al-As, he was like Khalid ibn Walid, and uh, he showed a lot of enmity and hostility to Islam, and Uthman bin Talha. 
He also was one of amongst those who fought against the Prophet ﷺ for a very long time and always wished bad to the Muslims and to the Prophet ﷺ. Both were, both were leaving Mecca secretly to go and embrace Islam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted those three to accompany one another to arrive to the Prophet ﷺ. When the Prophet ﷺ saw them from far arriving, the Prophet ﷺ says, look at those three, Quraysh had given up its own blood. Man, these are the best of people of Quraysh. You know, they, they are the future of Quraysh. They are the youngsters and the future of Quraysh. The Prophet ﷺ said, Look, Quraysh had thrown to you its own blood. So Khad ibn Walid came and sat in front of the Prophet ﷺ and he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, I came to embrace Islam, but under one condition. Under one condition. That you ask Allah to forgive me. I'm the one that killed and slaughtered many Muslims. I am responsible for a lot of the harm and the death of many Muslims. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Khalid, just you embracing Islam, Allah will forgive your past. He said, that, he said, Oh Messenger of Allah, understand that, but I want you. I want you as the Messenger of Allah to ask Allah to forgive me. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Oh Allah, forgive Khalid and forgive Khalid for what he done. So Khad ibn Walid embraced Islam said, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasoolah. And then it's true what the Prophet ﷺ said. He later on became someone with status in Islam. He became the drawn sword of Allah. And also Amr ibn al-As embraced Islam. And Uthman bin Talha embraced Islam. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive their past. And what a past. What a past, a very, very dark past. Being responsible for the death of many, many Muslims. And who, which Muslims? The best of believers, the Sahaba of the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. But yet, Islam did not restrict them from becoming Muslims. And the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam did not turn away from them. For them to become from amongst, not his companions, but the best of the companions. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum wa ardahum. Also, my brothers... Sulh al hudaybiyah once again, the Hudaybiyah truce, or the Hudaybiyah treaty, was an opening for the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for the da'wah, which is the main and primary purpose that the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam came for. The Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam did not come and kill or declare war. We need to understand that the jihad, which is fighting in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not an objective. It is not a goal that we go for. It is a mean for an objective. It is a mean for an objective. Our main objective is to spread the word of Islam. Our main objective is to spread the word of Islam. Whatever it takes to do that, by looking at the best interest for the Muslims, that's what you do. And that's why jihad is a mean to an objective. Some Muslims think that a jihad is the objective. This is what I want to do. No. Jihad is an objective for I mean, Which is to call to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you could call to Allah azza wa jalla without fighting, then that's what you should be doing. And that's what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi did. And when the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam saw, it was a great opportunity for him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to start spreading the word of Islam. Outside the Arabian Peninsula, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did not hesitate one second. And that's what he did after the Hudaybiyah truce. Where alayhi salatu was salam took advantage, took advantage of the truce between him and the people of Quraysh. That there's no fighting, no war. No one is allowed to harm one another. No one is allowed to go near each other. Whoever wants to do whatever they want, they can. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam took advantage of that. Especially the alayhi salatu was salam managed to humiliate the greatest powers that were standing in front of him in the Arabian Peninsula. And that was Quraysh. And Ghatafan, which was one of the biggest tribes in the Arabian Peninsula, and the Jews who were standing against him, and they were plotting and planning against him for a long time. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam looked at his strategy of the da'wah, and then he started to write letters to the kings and the princes of the neighboring towns, the neighboring cities, the neighboring states, the neighboring empires. And amongst those that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he sent, he sent to all the greatest empires around him. And when the Prophet ﷺ intended to do that, they told him, O oh, Messenger of Allah, you're talking to emperors, and you're talking to kings, 
and you are sending letters to a prince, and you are sending letters to big people, you know, you are sending letters to the superpowers at that time. They told them, our messenger of Allah, they would not accept a letter that's not sealed. There's got to be a stamp. So Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't say no. He said, no, we're not going to follow the kuffar. You know, that's the customs of the kuffar. People have to follow us. Nabi Alayhi Wasallam does not look at those pity things that sometimes we make those pity things an obstacle for the da'wah. We make those little things and pity things an obstacle for the da'wah. The Prophet Alayhi Wasallam, he said, if it's a seal, I'll make a seal. No problems. Even if it's something that the kuffar came up with and a custom amongst the kuffar. But the da'wah is bigger than just a seal. And this is the vision of the Muslim should always look bigger than just those little things that they become an obstacle later on for the da'wah. The da'wah is a lot more greater than that. So the Prophet ﷺ said, if it's about a seal, I'll have a seal. And then the Prophet ﷺ had asked the companions to make a seal for him from silver. And he had on it Muhammad Rasulullah. Muhammad the Messenger of Allah. And as respect to the word of Allah, he made it Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. His name, there were three lines. His name on the third line, Rasul on the second line, and Allah on the first line. So the word of Allah does not become under the word of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at this respect and love to Allah. So it was Allah, Rasul, Muhammad. In which you read it, Muhammad, Rasulullah. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam chose the best of the companions that he sees to be the best of his messengers to represent Islam and send them to the right people and right emperors and prince and kings and leaders and governors that were living at that time. And this began in Muharram, the seventh year of the Hijrah. This began in Muharram, which means the month that we're in right now, Muharram, the first month of the Islamic calendar in the seventh year of the Hijrah. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wrote a letter to an Najashi, the Ethiopian emperor, Nigus. And his original name was Ashama. Ibn al-Abjar, that's his name. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Amr ibn Umayyah al-Damari to carry the letter and to go on the behalf of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the believers and give him the letter. And the Prophet alayhi salatu wa sallam, he had written in that letter, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, in the name of Allah. This is the letter sent from Muhammad, the Prophet of Allah, to Negus al-Shama, the king of Abyssinia, or Ethiopia. Peace be upon you. And peace be upon uh, those who follow the truth, guidance, and believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, His Messenger. I bear witness that there is no God but Allah, alone, with no associate. He has taken neither a wife nor a son to indicate to him. Why? Because the Negus, what was he? He was Christian. He believed that Isa is the son of Allah, which means if Isa is the son of Allah, Maryam is the wife of Allah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, I witness that there is no God except Allah, no son, no mother, no wife, no one. He is alone, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that Muhammad is his slave and messenger, and I call you unto the fold of Islam. If you embrace Islam, you will be in safety. And then the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam, he also writes a verse from the Quran Al-Kareem, Ya Ahl Al-Kitab Ta'ala ila kalimatin sawa'in baynana wa baynakum, Allah na'abuda illa Allah, wa la nushrik bin shay'a, وَلَا يَتَخِذَ بَعْضُنَا بَعْضًا أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُولِ اللَّهِ فَإِنْ تَوَلَّا فَقُولُ شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ Say, O oh Muhammad, O oh people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, come to a word that is just between us and you, that we worship Allah alone, and that we associate and partner with Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that none of us shall take others as lords beside Allah. Then, if they turn away, say, bear witness that I and we are from the Muslims. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, Should you reject, he's saying that to the Negus, should you reject this invitation, then you will be held responsible for all the evils of the Christians of your people. You are responsible, you are the head. If the head changes, everything changes. So the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam said, If you reject my letter, then you are responsible for all the wrongdoings of your people. Subhanallah, ikhwan, if someone is looking for the truth, the truth is there. So, and Najashi Negus, he realized he's dealing with a prophet. He's not dealing with any man. And he had no other choice except to take the letter that was given to him by the companion radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Amr ibn Umayyah, and put it over his eyes. And he started to weep and cry 
and he said, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu. I testify that there's no God except Allah and Muhammad his messenger. And then he sent the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam a letter. And he said, Bismillah, to Muhammad, the messenger of Allah, from the Najashi, Negus, the emperor of Ethiopia. Peace be upon you, O the messenger of Allah, and the blessings of Allah upon you. There is no God except Allah, la ilaha illahu. And then he said, I have received your letter in which you have mentioned about Jesus, and by the Lord of the heavens and the earth, Jesus is not more than what you said. He's not more than that. He's a human being. He's not more than what he said, O Muhammad. We fully acknowledge that with which you have been sent to us, and we have entertained your cousin and his companions, because the companions, the first and second migration during the time of Mecca, they went to Abyssinia. And the Prophet ﷺ said, get to that land where there is a king that would not mistreat anyone. I bear witness that, they, that you are the messenger of Allah, true and confirming those who have gone before you. I pledge to you through your cousin and surrender myself through him to the Lord of this world. He gave bay'ah, he gave a pledge to Ja'far, the cousin of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I am a Muslim. And the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked the, the Najashi, the niggas to send Ja'far back home as the Muslims now in a state of strength, there's no need for him to stay in Abyssinia. So uh, the so niggas, what he done, he respected the letter of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the cousin of the Prophet Alaihi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the delegation that came and including the messenger of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam prepared two ships and he sent them back to Medina. And they arrived while the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam was in Khaybar. And in Najashi, the niggas died two years after that and the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam prayed on him the absent funeral prayer. Prayed on the Najashi, prayed on the niggas the absent funeral prayer. So he was a Muslim. And then his, and then his successor became, he's the successor that came after uh, Negus, they say some of narrations say that he became a Muslim and other narrations say that he did not embrace Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ala. Also, the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam sent a letter to the vicegerent of Egypt, Al-Muqawqas. And the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam had uh, delegated one of the companions to go to him. His name is Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. And the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam had written to him from Muhammad, slave of Allah and his messenger to Muqawqas, the vicegerent of Egypt. Peace be upon who follows truth and guidance. Therefore, I invite you to accept Islam. Therefore, if you want security, accept Islam. If you accept Islam, Allah, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should, uh, should reward you in this world. But if you refuse to do so, you will, be, you will bear the burden of the transgressions of the Qupts. Because Egypt were Qupts. Then the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam also written to him the same verse, say, O oh Muhammad, to the people of the scripture, the Christians and Jews, come to a word that is just between us and you, that we worship none but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and we do not associate any partners with him, and that if none of us shall take others as lords beside Allah, then if they turn away, say, bear witness that, they are, that we are Muslims. So Al-Muqawqas found it too hard to accept Islam, but he did not mistreat the messenger of the Messenger of Allah, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a. And what he did, he said, he spoke to him, and there was, he asked a few questions from Hatib, and he obviously had a translator, because these are emperors, they will have translators from different, uh, for different languages. So he asked uh, Hatib, he said, I believe that one day a prophet will be Jew, but I never thought that he'll ever come out from the Arabian Peninsula. You know, the Arabian Peninsula was the last place for people to think. The Arab were in the lowest state of civilization in comparison to the other empires back then. And then he said, I thought that one day this man will come out of Syria. You know, Syria was a civilized place for the Romans. And then he asked Hatib radiallahu ta'ala a few questions about Islam, and Hatib replied back to him. And at the, end of, at the end, he did not embrace Islam, but he treated Hatib radiallahu ta'ala anu, the messenger of the messenger of Allah, with respect and kindness. And not only that, he written a letter back to the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam saying, in the name of Allah, the most beneficent and most merciful, from Muqawqas to Muhammad bin Abdullah, peace be upon you, uh, peace be upon you. I heard uh, and read your letter and understood its contents. And what you are calling for, I already know that the coming of the Prophet is still due, but I used to believe he would be born in Syria. 
I am sending you as a present two maids who, came from a no who come from a noble Coptic families, clothing and a mount for you to ride on. Peace be upon him. Very diplomatic. You know, Egyptians are very diplomatic. You know, from then till now, mashallah. So, in a very diplomatic form, he did not say anything against the Prophet Sallallahu He did not degrade the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And not that he even agreed, not that he agreed with him. He did not uh, embrace Islam. He sent with Hatib radiallahu ta'ala and two maids. One of them, her name is Maria, and the other one is Nisreen. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi got married to Maria. And the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam gifted Nisreen to Hassan bin Thabit, one of the companions. And from Maria, she gave birth to Ibrahim, the son of the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam. And most of the scholars say that the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam freed her. So she was no longer a slave. She was a free woman. The Prophet Sallallahu got married to her. And then the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam had a child from her, Ibrahim. And Ibrahim later on passed away before he even reached the age of winning. And he also sent the Prophet Alayhi Salatu Wasallam a mount. For the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam to ride on. And he also sent him a garment. Something for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam as a gift. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasalam wore it. Not that he said, you know, this is from the kuffar or this from that. And Nabi sallallahu alayhi wasalam wore it. And this shows us that you are allowed to accept gifts from a kafir. If it's something that you do not compromise your religion in, of course. And that's the main thing in life. Also the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam sent a letter to the Persian emperor. To the Persian emperor, Kisra. Kosros, and he was the most aggressive, the most harshest one out of all. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah azza wa jal gives everyone what they deserve. The Prophet alayhi salatu was salam sent a letter to him with a companion called Abdullah ibn Hudhaf al-Sahami. In that letter the Prophet sallallahu says, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim in the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. From Muhammad, the messenger of Allah to Kosros, king of Persia. Peace be upon him who follows truth, guidance, believe in Allah and His Messenger, and testify that testifies that there is no God but Allah and alone, with no associate. And that Muhammad is the slave and the messenger of Allah. I invite you to accept the religion of Islam, the religion of Allah. I am the messenger of Allah sent to all people in order that I may in, uh, infuse fear of Allah in every living person, and that the charge may be proved against those who reject the truth. Accept Islam as your religion so that you may live in security. Otherwise, you will be responsible for the sins of the Magians or the sins of the Majus. Now, this Khosro is an emperor, an emperor of one of the greatest superpowers back then. He got so angry, he grabbed the letter and ripped it and turned it apart and he threw it. And he spoke with pride. He said, someone from my nation, because the Arabs... Half were with the Romans and the other half were with the, uh, with the Persians. He said, someone from my nation puts his name before my name. From Muhammad to Khosrows. Someone from my people puts his name before my name. So with full pride, he sent to his governor in Yemen. And he had a governor there, a Persian governor. His name is Badan in Yemen. And Yemen was totally under Persia. And he said to him, send him two men. Not more, two men. So what does that mean? His authority. People fear him. You know, he doesn't send an army. Just send him two men from the men that you trust and bring him to me as soon as possible. He didn't say send an army like two men. Why should you? You know, we are bigger than uh, sending an army. These people should fear us just by a letter. So those two men came to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they told him, Shahin Shah, the king of the kings who is Khosrows, had written to our governor and king, Badan, that we come and take you back to him. So the Prophet alayhi salatu was saying from his wisdom, he didn't say, who, who do you think you are? You come into my place and you're talking to me like that. He never saw someone with full wisdom. He's a da'iyah, he's someone to bring people to the deen of Allah. He's not here for himself. And this is where we sometimes we need to distinguish when we call for Allah or call for ourselves. He said, Go and relax under my hospitality. Have whatever you want and come back to me tomorrow. Come back to me tomorrow. The next day they came to the Prophet Muhammad Wasallam. Okay, we need to go now. Go where? To the king of the kings. Khosrows, he's waiting for us. So the Prophet Wasallam said, go back to your governor and tell him 
that my Lord had destroyed your Lord. Tell him, my Lord had destroyed your Lord. When the news came to the Prophet والسلام, that Khosra is when he received the letter, he ripped it and turned it apart and then his back has, the Prophet وسلم, said, my Allah to his kingdom. Ma Allah destroy his kingdom. That night that those two came to the Prophet ﷺ to take him to the Persian emperor, that same night Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made the son of the Persian emperor Khosra turn against his father and kill him. So the Prophet ﷺ, revelation from Allah came to him to tell him that. And not only that, look what happened. Through that, look what happened. Those two men we're shocked. What's going on here? We come to come and capture this man from the mirror of the, you know, from the mirror of the desert. Now he tells us, "My Lord had destroyed your Lord." They went back to Yemen, to their king in Yemen, Badan, and they told and they told him exactly what the Prophet ﷺ told them. So Badan, from his wisdom, he said, "Let me hear the news. If it's true what happened, because it's impossible that will happen today." And then the Prophet ﷺ. Three, four thousand kilometers away from them, he'll, he'll know about it the next day. They need at least two, three months travel. So this man, Badan, said, I'll wait. If it's true what this man said, obviously this man is a man of God. If it's not, then I'm going to go and take him and bring him with my own hands. Later on, the news came to Badan, the governor of Yemen, and exactly the same day, the Prophet ﷺ said that my Lord had destroyed your Lord, and the son of your Persian emperor had turned against him and killed him. But then said, this is a man of God. So he became a Muslim and he called all the people of Yemen to become Muslims. Subhanallah, the da'wah of Islam. Then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam sent a letter with one of the companions radiallahu ta'ala anhu ismu. His name is Dahya al-Kilbi. And he's the famous companion that Jibreel used to always come in his figure. He sent a letter to Caesar, the king of Rome. In that letter, the Prophet ﷺ said from Muhammad, the slave of Allah and his messenger, to Hercules, king of Byzantia. Blessed are those who, who follow truth and guidance. I invite you to embrace Islam that you may live in security. If you come, with the, if you come into the fold of Islam, Allah will give you double rewards. But in case you turn your back upon it, then... The burden of the sins of your people shall fall on your shoulders. And then the Prophet ﷺ also added the verse that he had added to the king of Egypt and the uh, king of Abyssinia or the emperor of Abyssinia as they were Christians. But he did not add that to Khosrows because he was not a Christian. He was a Majus. They used to worship the fire. So, O Muhammad, O people of scripture, come to a word that is just between us and you. That we worship number Allah Azza wa Jal and that we associate our partners with Him and that none of us shall take one another as lords beside Allah. Then if you turn away, say, we bear witness that we are Muslims. <coughs> Dahiya radiallahu ta'ala anhu took this letter from the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam to meet with the Roman or to meet with the Roman emperor Hirakl, Hercules. And there's a famous hadith narrated in Bukhari about an amazing dialogue that took place between the, the Roman Emperor and uh, uh, Abu Sufyan ibn Harb. The Romans, they had taken over Syria, Jordan, Palestine. So Jerusalem was under the Roman Empire. So Dahiya Kilbi asked where is the Roman Emperor at that time? He was in Jerusalem. So he went to Jerusalem. And some narrations say, that he passed it to one of the governors of the Roman Emperor in Basra and he gave it to Hirakl Hercules in, uh, in, uh, in, in Jerusalem. When uh, the letter arrived to the Roman Emperor, he read it and he realized that these words are not the words of a man. Anyone with wisdom knows that these words are not the words of a man, a normal man. These words are words of a prophet and a messenger. So he asked, is there anyone here in Jerusalem right now that's close to this man from his family, from his tribe, from his people, from his race? So they told him there is people from Quraysh. But who were they? They were Abu Sufyan, the enemies of the Prophet at that time. So the Roman Emperor, Hercules, asked to bring Abu Sufyan and his people. And he brought a translator with him. 
And he told, who is the closest person to, you, to Muhammad? So Abu Sufyan said, I'm the closest one to him. Through the tribes, family links. So he told them, come forward. And then he told the people behind them, the Arabs, if this man says any lie, stop him and say that he's saying lie. So Abu Sufyan Allah said, these people are so close to me, they would not stop me, even if I say a lie. Anyway, Hercules was smart. So he asked him a few questions. He said to his translator, ask him, what's the descendants of this man? What's his family tribe? What's his family links? What, does he, what is he to use? So Abu Sufyan replied back, he said, he comes from a noble descent. So he told him what he came with. Have you ever heard anyone before him saying the same things? So Abu Sufyan said, no. And then he said, any of this man, referring to the Prophet ﷺ, any of his parents, his grandparents were kings? So Abu Sufyan said, no. So I asked him, he said, are the weak ones or the poor ones or the rich ones follow him? So Abu Sufyan said, the poor ones. So he asked, are they increasing or decreasing? He said, no, they're increasing. Then he asked again, have you heard anyone leaving his religion as anger from him, from his religion? So Abu, Fi Abu Sufyan said, I haven't heard anyone. No. And then he said, have you ever experienced any lie on this man before he became a prophet or before he called for what he called for? So Abu Sufyan said, no, he was very honest. And then, they, then he asked him and he said, have you, in, have you ever experienced any vein or any breaking of the truth, a truce or any breaking of the traitor or conditions if you agree with him? Is he a traitor? They said, no. Abu Sufyan said, we haven't experienced that from him and now we are in a truce between us and him. We don't know what he's going to do. He doesn't want to praise him too much. You know, now we're in truce between us and him. We don't know what he's going to do. But the reality is we haven't experienced any Betrayal from him. And then he asked him, have you ever fought him? He said, yes. And then the Roman emperor asked again, he said, and how's the fight between you and him? So Abu Sufyan said, like ordinary war, once we win, once he wins. Until he destroys us or we destroy him. And then he said, what does he ask you? What, what, what's his, what did he call you for? I want to know what is he calling you for? He said, he's calling us to worship no one but God, one God, not to associate any partners with him. To live what our forefathers used to say, to pray, honesty, you know, chastity, to keep ties with the kings. I mentioned all these good things. And then the Roman emperor is just listening and he's amazed from the, like all these things about the Prophet. ﷺ. So he told his translator, tell this man, I asked you about his descent. He said he comes from a noble descent. And that's the case with all prophets and messengers. They all come from noble descent. Then I asked you, has anyone before him said or spoke with what he is speaking with now? He said no. So I said to myself, maybe he's imitating, he's trying to follow someone before him. Then I asked you, are any of his parents kings? And he told me no. Then I said to myself, maybe he had one of his parents was king and now he is claiming something, a kingdom, a monarchy that belongs to his parents. And then I asked you, did you ever experience lies from him from before the prophecy? And he said no. So I said to myself, if this man does not lie to people, how could he lie to Allah? And lie on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then I asked you, are the poor ones or the weak ones follow him? And he said, the poor ones. And I said, then I said to myself, and that's the case with the prophets and messengers, always the poor ones are his followers. Then I asked you, do they increase or not? And he said, they increase. And then I said to myself, and that's the case with the iman until it's completed. And then I asked you, does anyone, from his, does anyone leave him or leave his religion as anger from him? And then he said, no. And, so, and then I said to myself, and that's the iman, the belief, until it mixes with the heart. And then I asked you, does, have you ever experienced any betrayal from him? And he said, no. And I said to myself, the prophets and messengers are not traitors. And then I asked you for what he calls for. And he said, he calls for worshiping no one but Allah and calling for the prayers and the honesty and chastity and so on. And then I said, and then I said, these are beautiful things. And then he told him, the Roman emperor told Abu Sufyan, he said, if it's true what you told me about this man, this man is going to rule what's under my feet. If it's true what you told me about this man, this man is going to conquer what's under my feet. 
And I knew that there is time for a prophet that's due to come out, but I never thought that he'll be from amongst you. And I wish if I could meet him, and if I was next to him, I'll wash what's over his feet. Allahu Akbar. Who is saying that? The Roman emperor, the, the emperor and the king of the greatest superpower back then, saying, if I see Muhammad, I'll wash what's over his feet. Why? Because he used his intellect. He stopped and he said, let me put all my lust, let me put all my desires on the side, let me just think about it logically. Someone like this can be a liar. Someone like this cannot be a liar. Then, when he's, then he read the letter of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam again, and then the voices, people start to speak, you know, what's this? You know, this is our king, what is he saying? And then he told the, Abu Sufyan his people to you, leave the castle or to leave the place. When Abu Sufyan was walking out, he said, amazing. Ibn Abi Kipsha, they used to degrade the Prophet ﷺ by calling him Ibn Abi Kipsha. The Prophet ﷺ, breastfeeding mother, or his fostering breastfeeding mother, her husband, was, his name was Abi Kipsha. So they used to degrade the Prophet ﷺ by saying he is the son of Abu Kipsha. He is the son of Abu Kipsha. So Abu Sufyan said, the matter of the son of Abu Kapsha, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, had reached all the way to the kings of Rome. Like in other words, Muhammad's matter, his religion, had shaken the ground under the thrones of the kings of Rome. And then Abu Sufyan said, by Allah, I knew that Islam will prevail after that day. Look at this, you know, look at the, the style of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And then he went back and... Uh, and the, uh, the Roman emperor gave a lot of presents and gifts to the messenger of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Dahiyyat Kilbi and he came back to the Prophet alayhi wa sallam on the way he got robbed with those presents so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sent a, a, a troop to bring back what they've taken from Dahiyya radiallahu ta'ala anhu a small you know a, a, a small, a small <coughs> expedition that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked the companions to gain then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu sent another letter to Al-Mundhir ibn Sawi and the Prophet Sallallahu also calls him to Islam and then he sent another letter to Hawza ibn uh, Ali, the, the governor of Yamama. He sent another letter to Al-Harith ibn Abi Shamar al-Ghassani, the governor of Damascus. And then the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent a letter to the kings of uh, Oman and there were two brothers, their name was Jafar and his brother Abd, the children of Jul uh, al Julan Day. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continues sending the letters to those who the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sees as governors. And the policy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with the governors that if they embrace Islam, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam keeps them as governors. And this is what? This is the style of the da'wah. Why? Because the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam talks to people according to their language and understanding. This guy is a king. Or this guy is a governor. This guy is a leader. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not want the leadership to be the, to be the warrior of this person to embrace Islam. Become a Muslim, I'll keep you a leader, but under Islam. Become a Muslim, I'll keep a leader under Islam. And many of those embraced Islam. Inshallah, we'll continue with more of that, inshallah, next week. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from amongst those who listen and hear and act upon all the listen he. Subhanak Allah, alhamdulillah, nashadu an la ilaha illa ant, nastaghfiruka wa natubu lak. To listen to or download more Islamic lectures, please visit www.islamicmedia.com.au.